his last season of Sonic the Hedgehog, it's most TV shows aren't very good. So how did they get made? One reason could be what most of us think of as a good show or a good idea doesn't sell. So to prove that, we went to the Television Producers Expo in Las Vegas, uh, better known as NAPT. This is a NAPT convention, and let real people pitch their ideas for real TV shows right to our camera. And I'm going to show you the pictures. These are the actual pictures they made to producers and all those people. We want you to guess whether you think they were sold or not sold. So just yell out your answer as we have another edition of Pitch to America. <laughs> Barry's these celebrity garbage. Each week I go into the garbage of celebrities and look for things like J-Lo's old wedding albums. That makes sense, doesn't it? Madonna's underwear. I wonder what they look like. Paris Hilton's old videos. And maybe Michael Jackson's old clown makeup. <laughs> Hi, it's Barry Z from the Barry Z Show, live at the Metropolitan Room, talking to the legend herself, Julie Budd. How are you, sweetie? Oh, my God. What a show. show. I have no voice left from yelling and screaming. <laughs> Thank you so much. Wow. It's, my, it's my home. It's my new home. Uh, this is the best home anyone could ever have. You know? Well, I'm one lucky gal. Oh, you are. So a way to be interviewing you and seeing the show tonight. Tell me about the show. Well, it was dedicated to Frank Sinatra, right? Well, yeah. It's, uh, you know, I have my CD, Remembering Mr. Sinatra. Right here. Remembering Mr. Sinatra? Yes, yes. I'm wow. very excited about it. With the top hat on. With the top hat. Well, I'll tell you, you know, um, I worked with Mr. Sinatra. When I was 16 years old, he invited me to... That was a year ago. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> but, but he invited me to be his special guest at Caesar's Palace. And I, I'm aware that there are a lot of tribute CDs out there, but mine was a very, very personal project because I worked with him, and he was wonderful to me. And so... Uh, and the latest news is that this is going to be nominated well, for a Grammy Award. It's not nominated. I, I made the entry list. Okay. I'm on the entry list, and I hope that I hope that I, I could get a nomination. I hope so. You are going to get a nomination. I hope so. I, I can feel it. <laughs> well, it was an honor to be even thought of in, 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 that, in that respect. Now, is this the first time you've done a show dedicated to Frank Sinatra? Yes. Yes, it is. And um, tonight, we added a little bit more uh, than uh, just the songs that are on the CD. We talked about some of the friends that Mr. Sinatra had, like Lena Horne and Judy Garland and Ella Fitzgerald and Sammy Davis. And I knew Ella Fitzgerald. She was a wonderful woman. She really, really Did was. Did you perform with her, too? I didn't perform with Ella. We performed at the same venues. And so we always, we were always sort of thrown together, you know? Amazing. Yeah. Yeah, she was a very, very generous woman. Now, what I learned from tonight's show, you taught me a lesson tonight, is surround yourself with the people that Sinatra sa surrounded himself with. Right, well, what you're saying is, um, is what I said on stage that Mr. Sinatra said, that it was really, really important uh, to surround yourself with the best. And um, it's just going to make you even more, and you're going to learn a lot. And you're going to learn a lot. And... Um, you know, it was a great, it was a great opportunity that Tell I Tell me about the names of the people who surrounded him, or that he surrounded. You said that on stage. Yes, John Costa and Nelson Riddle, of course, those were his orchestrators, you know. And Ella, he was, he was crazy about Ella, and Billie Holiday, oh. and Lena Horne, and Tony Bennett. Wow. Of course, Tony Bennett is a remarkable singer, and, you know, they loved one another dearly. And um, Sammy Davis... I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Did he do duets with all of them? Yes, he did. And also, uh, he was very, very friendly with Duke Ellington. Oh, wow. Yeah, he loved him as a composer. He just adored his work. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sure you do, too. Oh, well, what's not to love? <laughs> well, this comes naturally, it you know, really singing these songs. Yes, it comes. You're very sensitive, because that happens to be absolutely true. It is the most authentic material for me that, that I think I've ever performed. Did you grow up, you know, being in a big band yourself? Interesting question, and I'll tell you why. Because when I started in show business, every place in those days, you know, when I was a kid, all of them had huge orchestras, huge. And when I became old enough to play, a lot of the venues, uh, like the Copacabana, or, you know, some of the finest, you know, rooms around the country, 
they all had 15, 16, 20 piece orchestras. Wow. When I opened up uh, with Mr. Sinatra, there was a 45 piece orchestra. Oh my God. So when I, when I came into the business, small combos were not really my thing. It was large orchestras. But you have the voice. Tell me about that voice. It's incredible. <laughs> Thank you. Wow. Thank you How so much. describe it? Well, I'm very lucky that I have a lot of range to my voice. And, and I'm interested in a lot of different genres of music. So I think, I think the most important thing that I really learned from Mr. Sinatra is, is that you really have to keep listening. It's important throughout your career to keep listening. And when he said to me, Julie, I surround myself with the best... He also said to me, I do that for a very specific reason. Of course, it's going to make me look greater. It always does. But you're going to learn a lot. You're going to learn a lot. And so, you know what? That's kind of the way I feel. You've done that in your life, right? Surrounded yourself with the best, the very best. I've been m so fortunate. So fortunate. I have. I mean, I've, I've been with the same conductor now. Since Bernstein, who I just interviewed. Yes, a brilliant man, and, ah. I've, and I've been with him since I'm 12 years old. Ah. Yeah, I do all my symphonies with Herb, and wow. he's a wonderful orchestrator. And you know what really, really, uh, what I was taking note uh, of in, in tonight's uh, evening. The tonight's music incredible evening. <laughs> Thank you. Was the fact that they were augmented... Um, down. They were originally written for symphony, but they were all, yes, and they were augmented down to the five or six pieces that I had on stage, oh but they did not sound like a small combo. Oh, no. No, it was written very richly, and, and the, the voicing was beautiful, and only Herb knows how to do that. Yeah. So this is your new home, right? This is the Metropolitan Room. Yeah. The most incredible room in New York. It's, it's really become my home. Bernie and Joanne couldn't have been more like family members. I mean, they've been unbelievable, and their, their artistic taste and, and, and how, they, um, how they help you be the best that you could be. You know, it's there like, you there you go again, surrounding yourself with the best. What's so incredible about you and Bernie and Joanne is that they are preserving this type of music that can be a lost art if it's not you know, like preserved. You're absolutely right. And it's interesting that you should say that because when, when I worked for Mr. Sinatra, he asked very, very little of me. He let me, he really trusted me to go out and to, and to do the right work. But the one thing, Barry, that he did ask me to do, so it's, it's very sensitive that you said that, he said to me, Julie, you must promise me that you will continue to do this material. Wow. He said, because if you don't, no one's going to know it's out there. So what you're doing is preserving the classics. I'm preserving the classics, but I also, um, I also do recognize that the American Songbook is an evolving art, and that new writers need to be recognized as well. Amazing. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So this is your contribution to American musical history. Right? Well, you know, I hope so. I hope so. Have you written any of your own songs also? No. Herb is the uh, musical right. writer in the family. I write a lot of dialogue. As a matter of fact, I'm in, the, I'm in the middle of finishing a book right now. A book? Yeah. Finally! I know. Oh, I know. wow. That we're going to turn into a Broadway musical now. <laughs> <laughs> and then a film. I don't know, but... I know. <laughs> but, but the book is, is, is an homage to a lot of the greats that I was so fortunate. And you the, have pictures of all these and people. Pictures and beautiful pieces of art that they had given me and I, uh, tremendously tremendous what is the book going to be called i'm not telling you uh, when I'm, when when it's completely finished i promise you and i will great. chat about it that's great you know my favorite julie budd movie was the devil and max devlin oh my gosh i love delia gould in that movie he was just on my show not too long ago you know he is just the nicest man oh, is. isn't he oh yeah He's just the, uh, the most sincere man. And he loves you endlessly. Oh, well, I love him, too. Or to the, the endless extent of, of living. He's a special man. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so are you, Barry. Oh, was that one of your highlights, doing that movie, by the way? It really was. Wow. It really was. I enjoyed it. And I had a tremendous role. And, I, of course, oh, yeah. that was the first project that I ever did with Marvin Hamlish. At Disney? Yeah, at Disney. Wow. Yeah. Do you have any other movies that you've done or that you will be doing? Um, I did another movie. I had a very small role in it. Uh, 
It was called Two Lovers with Joaquin Phoenix. Oh, wow. Yeah. But it was, I had a very small role in that, but I was so happy to do it because, again, surrounding myself with James Gray, a wonderful director, wow. and Joaquin Phoenix, great actor. Unbelievable. Yeah. Have you ever thought about doing the life story of a famous mu musical personality? No. No, I no. never did. But, you know, that's an interesting idea. There we go. Yeah. What about somebody portraying the fabulous Julie Budd on film? <laughs> oh, you could do it. I never thought about it. Wow. I never, you know, I never think of myself um, that way. I, oh. I, I think of myself um, as a work in progress oh, all the time. That's incredible. Well, thank you. You're thank a legend you. in the making. <laughs> Barry, you're so sweet. I love you. Good to see you. Mm, but don't leave because we have to talk about you being honored, right, in Brooklyn. Oh, on October 27th, it's the Brooklyn Hall of Fame, and Alan Dershowitz is going to be there, and Chuck Schumer is being inducted. I mean, there are a lot of really wonderful people, and I was, like, totally thrilled that I was even uh, sp spoken of. Well, you're from Brooklyn, too. Yes, of course. There we go. And Midwood, it, right? No, um, I wasn't. Herbie was the Midwood. You, Herbie, oh. you're Midwood, right? Herbie's not here. Okay. okay. Her, I think Herbie's the uh, Midwood section. I was um, more like Mill Basin. And I was Sheepshead Bay. Were you Sheepshead? Yeah, but Shelter Street. Which high school did you go to? Sheepshead. You went to Sheepshead? Yeah. Well, I was supposed to either go to Tilden or South Shore. Wow. But I wound up going to school in Manhattan because, of course, I was running around the globe singing. Oh, you know? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And what else? Do uh, you have a date here at the fabulous Metropolitan Room? On De December 10th? On December 10th, a Metropolitan Room. Wow. Um, and I'm also going to be at the Berry Center on December 12th, which is Mr. Sinatra's birthday, and we're going to celebrate the CD at the Berry Center. That's so in New Jersey, right? In New Jersey. So what I'm going to be doing is I'll be bringing my show back to Bernie and Joanne here at the uh, Metropolitan Room, and and then uh, the Berry Center wanted that show as well. So, because Bernie was so wonderful to let me put it on its feet here, I was able to uh, entice the Berry Center. Are we going to see you on Broadway soon? I don't know. I hope so. I hope so. And in film, I mean everywhere. Well, thanks. The world has to experience Julie Budd. Well. You know, that's really nice of you. And I hope that they'll the enjoy the CD. Because the CD, really, it's a, it's a labor of love. And um, I, like I said, I realized there were a lot of tribute CDs out it's this year, really being the centennial and everything. But, wow. but this was very personal because I knew him, you know? Wow. Yeah. And we know you, Julie Bud, even yeah. better now. You're a sweetheart, Barry. How do we meet you? Do you have a website? I have a, a juliebud.com, of course, and a lot of people visit me on Facebook as well. And we can buy your CD, right? All over the place. Amazon, CD Baby, iTunes, Barnes & Noble. Wow. Yeah, they're all carrying my CD. You just did a CD signing, right? I did, yeah, at Barnes & Noble. It was packed. Well, it was it. packed. I was thrilled it was packed. And yeah. you have the greatest new press agent, Richard Skipper. You don't get better than Richard Skipper. No, I told you, I'm the luckiest girl singer oh. in all of America. And I'm the luckiest person to be able to interview <laughs> you here at the Metropolitan Room, your new home. Thank you so much. Okay. And you have the nicest cameraman. Thanks. Thank you for and making You're going to win a, a Grammy Award for well, this listen, CD. We got on the on the entry list for your consideration. So, you know, if if it never goes any further than that, oh. it's it's all been a gift. No, it's because it's a real tribute and homage to Frank Sinatra. It really is. It, oh. On a very personal level. Wow. Yeah. Oh, by the way, I saw your videos uh, from the Merv Griffin show. Oh. Gosh, do you know they're rerunning all his shows? You know about that, don't no. you? There's a, a network called Get TV, right. and they are going to be rerunning all of the Merv Griffin oh, shows. Cool. I mean, I'm going to be seeing my life again thanks, flash buddy. before me. I mean, it's going to be deserve it because you're a real superstar. <laughs> well, thanks. So here I am, alone again Not at all like I thought that I would be Yes, I lost my way Seems like yesterday Somebody promised me the 
Tell me about this fantastic show you did here at the Metropolitan Room. What songs did you sing? Well, we did All the Way. We did I'm a Fool to Want You, which is a very, very important song for Mr. Sinatra, The Best is Yet to Come, which actually is written on his tombstone, The Best is Yet to Come. Cy Coleman, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I interviewed years back. Oh, what a nice man. I know. Yeah. What else was in the show? Oh, gosh. World on a String. Oh. And... Um, Let's see. We had For All We Know. Oh, my God. I'm Always Chasing Rainbows. You know what this, uh, the piece that I really loved was More Than You Know, The Nearness of You, oh. and The Very Thought of You. I think it was crying throughout that. It, 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 you know, the songs are like great scripts. They really are. And they what's so incredible about you is that you're essence-driven, so you're reliving all these songs. Yeah, they're, they're just great pieces. I mean, it's like having you know, a golden script to sing every night. Oh, God. You do it, baby. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thanks, Barry. Oh, you're Thanks the best. a lot. Thank you, guys. I want to get a picture with all of you. How do I? You, am I on? Hi, it's Barry Z from the Barry Z Show, live at the Met, right? With Randy Jones, live at the Metropolitan Room. <laughs> Tell us Bar what brings you here tonight. Well, well Barry, the, uh, Bobby Horowitz did a tribute. Had some of the, the uh, greatest lineup of performers. Everybody from Hillary Clinton to Yolanda to Jeff Harner to Katie Sullivan to Pam, Champagne Pam to Carly Ozard to... I'm, I know I'm leaving out people, but they were incredible people that sang and, and, in, and that are really, really wonderful entertainers in the art of cabaret. And that's one of the things... That's still left in my little, uh, my my wish bucket, my bucket of things that I want to do. Bucket list. Yeah, that's what. Okay. You, 
<laughs> See, that's, that's why I have kept him my pal all these oh. years, because he always knows how to fill in the blanks. There we go. <laughs> and, Barry, you and I have filled in some blanks over the oh years, baby. God. One of the best ones was at one of the Obies. Right? Okay. Whoa, where well, you just edited the hell out of that and put added stuff from this and that. You said you just saw my show with Michael Mustard. Yeah, I did, where you have me about 100 feet high on the back, that iconic photograph of me. I said, this is the great, if this is what Barry's show is looking like now with that virtual studio. It's incredible. Isn't it great? Yes, but when we did that, that, that Obie's interview about... It must have been 10, 15 years ago oh, that we did. We were talk, You talked about Bruce Jenner and all this kind of stuff, and yeah. now we can talk about... Is it Bryce Jenner? It's Craig, Caitlin Jenner. Caitlin. Caitlin. Um, no, it's not Bryce. Everybody thought it was going to be Bryce, didn't what they? Happened? Well, <laughs> I don't know. I've met. I made a movie with Bruce Jenner, but I've yet to. Can't be, stop the music. But can't stop the music. You can cut some of that in right now. <laughs> yes. Plus, I'm going to screen it at the cinema and that I do my we'll that I do my midnight shows in. Cinema Village. Cinema Village. Okay, if you do that, I will come and we'll do a talk back afterwards and we can gossip about everybody living and dead who's in it. You know who I'll get also? Marilyn Sokol. Marilyn is great. I just saw her, that show she did about In Bed with Roy Cohn. Unbelievable. Yeah, and Marilyn is still hanging in there. Um, I, and there may be a couple other people from the cast that are still <laughs> ambulatory <laughs> and, and might be living in New York. But, uh, yeah, but uh, it's You know been, what I learned tonight? What? About the life and times of Randy Jones is that you guys were the forerunner of all the boy bands. We, we're like the godfathers and some, some you know, bitchy columnists might like to say we're the grandfathers of boy bands. I mean, seriously. Uh, other than, I mean, if you want to call the Beatles a boy band, you can, but certainly the Monkees were kind of that, but they were only put together for television. We were really put together as a live act. And uh, so we are kind of the forerunners of all the boy bands. So, I mean, uh, on top of all the other stuff we did socio-politically and culturally, uh, I think uh, Backstreet, NSYNC, 90-something Degrees, all those little bands of, of boys, they, you know, we did it first. <laughs> and, and, and you know what? We did it in a way that nobody else has quite done it exactly like us since. And that, I mean, that doesn't in come... what way did you do it? Well, we did it where we uh, had took identities from every um, major male iconic stereotype in America that had already been sold around the world previous to us for 75 years with the Hollywood film industry. I mean, if you remember, the first, the first full-length feature film was The Great Train Robbery, where the cowboy takes the gun like this and shoots it bang directly into the lens and you see the explosion that was the first feature length film and it was a cowboy so for 75 years prior to what I did with Village People Hollywood had done the heavy lifting for me so all that I had to do was literally add some comedy and um, a wink a wiggle and a wave to it and you had YMCA how did you become the cowboy in the group? Well because I brought that to the group essentially when I first met the producers I was dressed in just cowboy hat and a plaid shirt and boots and a pair of tight jeans and you know I don't know if it was the hat the boots the shirt or the tight jeans that got you know got the job but whatever it was I got the gig and it's been a legacy for nearly 40 years that I I am so honored I'm humbled the fact that I was even had part would have a part in that legacy and it continues to this day I mean Yankees games top of the seventh inning they play YMCA opening of the Olympic Games they play YMCA I mean it's really hard to get away from us we're kind of like a benevolent virus once you come in contact with us you never ever forget did you go to an audition originally for the group I did not go to an audition I met I was working with Grace Jones before Grace Jones the iconic singer she had an album out that came out in 1976 that I helped her put that act was in her act which you won the one with portfolio with I need a man Aww. sorry trouble sending the clowns tomorrow I was one of the two guys on stage with her and that and from that the producers of village people had an idea for a group they saw me said we have a night well they, it was after a show like in a club in New York about 2 a.m. in the morning now and it was it Crisco Disco no no it was at the Sheridan um, the old Sheridan the Empire Room where uh, the disco forum the Billboard magazine used wow. to do the disco forum we had done a show there Grace had performed a couple of numbers I was there 
and, and I one of the costumes I wore was a, a leather jock strap with a chain around my waist and up the crack of my butt, and, which was got kind of cold until it warmed up. <laughs> and the, but I was until the audience warmed well, up. They, the audience were. I told you it was tight jeans or something that got me the job. But but uh, afterwards, I was in that costume. I mean, the moment I came off stage, and these guys, these producers who were both French with heavy French accents. Were they again? Jacques Morali and Henri Bololo come up to me and they say, we like the way you move, we like the way you look, we like your mustache, and, and the way you dance, can you sing? Because they hadn't really heard me sing because the backing vocals were on tracks. What year was that? This was 1976. This uh, before the first album uh, with San Francisco, Hollywood, Macha, uh, Village People, and Fire Island, and they said, "Do you want? We we have an idea for a group. We would like for you to be in it." And I said, "Well, sure, but I by that point in time, I'd been in New York almost two years, and I knew where originally from Raleigh, North Carolina. But I knew at that point in time, I knew that 2 a.m. in the morning, a dark club, when I'm standing there just about naked." And two guys come up to you with French accents and say, we want you to be in a group. I knew that could go either way. And <laughs> I didn't know what kind of group they wanted me to be in. But I did say, because I never, I, I, I'm always kind of prepared for an opportunity. I never like to turn anything down. I said, sure, but can we meet in the daytime, in an office, in the daylight? In a, Which way did it go, AC or DC? Well, it went village people way. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's, you know, European adapters and everything else. So who tagged you as a cowboy? How did you become a cowboy? When in the group? I walked into the audition when I had clothes on, I was dressed, I had that character. And uh, so that's pretty much what I bring to it. They didn't ask for that character, you just became it. I think I, inspire, I inspired it <clears throat> because it was also the way people were walking around in the West Village at that time, if you remember. People were... I, what happened in the West Village, if you read my book, Macho Man, The Disco Era and the Coming Out of Gay America, at that, in this early and mid-70s, was a time after Stonewall when most of America and our culture saw gay people as, as drag queens and transvestites. I mean, God bless Sylvia Rivera for picking up the parking meter and throwing it through the, the front windshield of the right. police car. But most people saw gay people as effeminate and saw them as dress, cross-dressers. We absolutely... Um, embodied what the movement at that time, which was gay men were reclaiming the male images of guys in motorcycle guys and soldiers and construction workers and cops and cowboys. So we were, re and so I kind of hit, I, I was, I hit it at the right time. I, I, that's the way I dress. It was part of a movement. It was part of an underground movement. And, but it was also, like I said before about the movie industry, it was an image that everybody in America could identify with and which absolutely is the most American iconic image of what it means to be on your own, responsible, solitary, is a cowboy. You can take care of yourself as long as you've got a good cup of coffee, a can of beans, and a good horse. There we go. And I, I'm a, all what kind of horse. A, <laughs> a big one. <laughs> How many iconic roles did the people in the group play? Well, the six of them. There were six. There was the cowboy. There was an Indian. Um, well, I say Indian. It's become politically correct to say Native American, but it's like Bruce Jenner and Caitlyn Jenner. At the time, he was the Indian. He's listed as the Indian on, on this. So you, we, can, we can be politically correct and say Native American, but it was the cowboy, the Indian, the construction worker, the biker, the guy in leather, wow. the soldier, and the cop. So there were, and there were six people. The hottest man you could ever come up with. Well, yeah, well, you know what? Even nowadays. The hottest man you could ever come up with for men and for women. And, and what you must remember is also for Halloween costumes for kids. And we were on lunch boxes. There were dolls. There were Halloween costumes. There were, in Japan, there were cartoons. There's still a movement right now. There may be a cartoon of us coming out. But, I mean, it, we did something that reaches across all spectrums of audience. Um, from young kids to, to adults to gay to straight to black to white to men to women to young to old and it didn't matter what you what your preference was you uh, you might have find you would find yourself in an audience with other a lot of different people enjoying the same thing which was us on stage what was so incredible is the pat let me try this again you, you got this what was so incredible was the fact that you guys you know, represented positive role models for the gay community. If you were gay and saw it that way. 
if you were a 10 year old kid, you saw a Halloween costume that you want, or one that your mommy and daddy didn't have to go buy, but they could make a, they could make, they could dress you up like a cowboy. I started dressing up like a cowboy in the 1950s when I used to watch all the westerns on television. So that's that's another reason I that the character that I created and and have promulgated all these years it's one that is so easily identifiable. And every little boy, most little boys, want to grow up and be a cowboy at least at some point in their life. Did Jock Morali or Morelli? Okay. Did Jock Morali decide upon these characters as the epitome of macho characters as far as the gay community went? I think in part he was definitely, he was new to America from France. He and Henri Belolo both were. And I think he was very much inspired what was happening in New York City in the village, in the West Village. And I mean, at that point, you could walk around and on walking up and down Christopher Street or on the streets, you could see some of these images. I think he was definitely inspired by that. He was also inspired by the fact that he was enamored with and loved what American pop culture was. That's why he came over here and he was so happy when he had a hit with the Ritchie family, which was the best disco in town. First, they were our sister, they were our sister group. And then when he was able to create an all boy group, an all man group, that was the brother group to the Ritchie family. He got us and we had all these images and then he started having hits. Uh, the first was San Francisco, Hollywood, Fire Island. Tell me about all your hits. Yeah. Well, the first, the first, what was the biggest in the first? I should say, tell me about all your hits. What was the first? The first one was, um, it was a club hit, San Francisco, Hollywood. And then on that same record, we had uh, Fire Island and Don't Go Fa Don't Go In The Bushes, Don't Go, that one, and Village People. Then on the second one was Macho Man. That was the big hit. We, I think we did the Crack the Top 30 in radio with Macho Man. Uh, and then the third one that really went all the way up the charts was YMCA. YMCA. Can't I know? Seriously, I mean, you know what? It, it that that is like that is that's a true virus. Everybody, I was just came back from Parsons, Kansas. Uh, I did a, a couple of benefits out there, and this is a town maybe fifteen thousand people. Everybody in that little farm town knew YMCA, and it's like. All I had to do was correct the way they make the M, because a lot of people make the M improperly. You mean but in terms of? Of the way where you hold your hands. The way you hold your hands. Yeah, let me show you. How do you do M in YMCA? Uh, y, no, show me Y. Show me a Y. Oh, y is no, no. No, we're not, no we're, not, we're not doing American Sign Language here. <laughs> what is the Y? Why is this? Oh, that way. That y. Way. Hello. And, and Amp, he's left-handed. Oh, you know what? Do you know how many get-out-of-jail-free cards that's been for him in his life? I'm left-handed. I'm sorry. So tell me. I write from, so you write from right to left, huh? <laughs> from right to left. So this was the Y? No, Y is up here. Up there. And then the M. Well, if you're not going to do it, I can't correct okay. you. So it's not even a good joke. Cut it out. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> do you want to do the YMCA? No, I don't. Cause Unbelievable. I told you, when you sit down like this, anyone over 25 should not sit or take a photograph without flash. Yeah, but he's filming us from the waist up. Right, that's good, right? <laughs> Let me ask you this. Your smile is incredible. Thank you. You look so incredible. When you said you were 63 on stage 63. tonight, I don't believe it. Well, I am a 63, born in 1952. But I do want to tell you, I have a new CD that comes out in March, April of 2016. It's called Mr. Right. Um, I'm headed now to uh, California tomorrow morning to shoot a new web series called Child of the 70s. I'm shooting the new upcoming documentary on Alan Carr called The Fabulous Alan Carr. Is he still around? No, but the oh. documentary is going to be, and it's directed by Jeffrey Schwartz, who did the Tab Hunter Confidential documentary. Oh, wow. So it's really, he does really good work. Uh, what the, naked label were you on? Uh, Casablanca. Casablanca. Yep. That was Neil Bogart. Right? That was Neil Bogart, and they're making actually a movie about it. He, one of Neil's uh, sons is producing it, and it's starring Justin Timberlake as Neil. 
Now, you thought you could make me lose my train of thought, wow. but from California, I fly to London where I'm doing the, the 2015 Film, Media, and Fashion Awards, and I'm also recording a track on the new recording project that's produced by Sean Lennon that Yoko has already done a track on, so I'm really happy about that. Then I come back, and I'm down at Disney World for about a week, and then I come, I'm, I'm in New York back in uh, December. I will be at... Yeah, I'll do your Barry Z. Cinema Classics at Cinema Village. That's right. If you can't stop the music. Absolutely, and we'll do a Q&A afterwards. Fantastic. Yeah. Oh, Before yeah. you leave me, I took the mic away from I him. know. That's so... You okay. deserve it. Well, you're bigger and taller than I am. Well, I wanted you to use your you hands, baby. Get busy. Yeah, but you're bigger and taller than me, and you win every time. Thank Doesn't you. that sound like Mommy Dearest, which is one of the movies that was... Yes! Great. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah um, it, uh, Mommy Dearest is a great movie. I was on the set for that when she... With the scene where she was cutting out the rose bushes. I was on that You're set. Kidding. Oh, no, I was on that set. What did she say in that scene again? Well, I can tell you what she did do is I was there, and at, at one point, somebody, when she was just hatcheting and cutting down all the rose bushes, and when she'd got all, almost all the way through all of them, cutting them down, she saw somewhere out of the corner of her eye she saw someone on the set that she that caught her attention she stopped it face stopped it and she said i cannot do this if there are people that shouldn't be here on the set so so they had to shoot the scene all over again and the greens people you know who make put the rose bushes there they had to redo the entire set for her to do it again but that's one thing i learned this is um, what faye dunaway did well that's faye i'm talking about faye dunaway I wasn't really on a set with Joan Crawford. I was on a set with Faye Dunaway, Barry. Wow. You know, I interviewed her once. Who, I Faye or, 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 or oh, Faye? Oh, and I not Joan? Her. No, that was a long time ago. So listen to me. When I interviewed Faye Dunaway, yes. she said to me, after I asked her what her favorite line was from Mommy Dearest, she said, excuse me, I don't have any. She doesn't like to talk about the movie, but you know what? That's, she's going to be remembered for that movie. She's going to be because that she represented a Hollywood icon, a legend that was box office poison. You know what I think it is, is I think she just hasn't come to embrace it yet. I think there's still time for her because she's really a great actress and she's got a great body of work. I think there's still time for her to embrace the wonderful things that she's done in her career that people will remember her for. They'll remember her for Bonnie and Clyde. Oh, yeah. Uh, but, you know, they're going to remember her for Mommy Dearest. Because she totally embodied Joan Crawford. Oh, yeah. She I heard she wasn't mad at me. She was mad at the dirt. <laughs> no, she was mad at the... She was mad at the dirt. Unbelievable. Yeah, and... Uh, and it you, seems that you know where the boys and the booze is. <laughs> yes, I do. The lines and you, were incredible. Yeah. When I interviewed the real Christina Crawford, oh, yeah. she said to me at the 50th anniversary of the screening of the movie at Town Hall, she said that these lines were embellished. Not all these lines were true. You mean uh, uh, afterwards they were created or, or, or Faye came up with them? They came up with the lines. Afterwards? Harry's. Oh, yeah, I think so too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, yeah, I, but, but Faye delivered them. Faye delivered them well, incredibly. Sure these were actual lines that uh, John Crawford said? Well, you know, that, that's part of what being a legend is. I think it absolutely... Um, uh, people will say you don't know if it is or not. Look, I'm screening Mommy Dearest right there. Right here. See Mommy that? Dearest. You're going to come for that one, in the right? lower, Well, what date is it? It's, uh, I don't know when. December. I don't come back till the middle of December to New York. Okay, so you'll be here, hopefully. If not, uh, I'll be back by the 19th because I think I'm doing a party at uh, the Eric Conran and Tommy Hotpants and all them do. By the way, could you perform as Joan Crawford? Get dressed up as No, because this mustache is never leaving. That's your trademark, isn't it? Well, it's one of them. What's <laughs> the others? Well, you know, the smile, the hat, Great smile. the jeans. You're the best. Everyone loves you. Thank you. you. Love you, too. And it's been too long since we've done this. I know. One quick question. How did the village people get the name village people? Um, I, I think because of that, uh, the uh, a lot of the images were inspired by what Jacques and Henry saw in the village, but also it has a much deeper meaning. Of we represented a wide variety, and of uh, lot every image was different, so we represented a village. Everybody who everybody's different, but everybody pulled together, and and. Uh, there were so many layers of, of deep political, socio-cultural stuff, and in what we did, maybe we weren't in, intentionally doing it from the outset, 
But when you look back on something 40, with 40 years of hindsight, you can see that there, was a, there are a lot of layers to what we did. Is there still a village people? Do you get together for reunions? Uh, I do not perform as it. There are only two of the original guys in the group that perform as village people now. But yes, there's a franchise. There's a group that performs under the franchise that performs a lot. They do several concerts a year. They do an incredible show. If you get to see it, do. And they actually um, uh, perform everywhere. And they represent what we did very well. And they keep all the music and all the numbers. Who are the two original members that are still in it? The Indian and the Soldier. Wow. Yeah, there's Felipe and who's the other one? Alex Briley. Oh, that's right. Yeah, wow. they're still there. What about you guys? You should be in it. No, I, I, I'm married for 32 years to my husband, and so I cannot be out on the road with five other guys all the time. What's your husband's name again? My husband's name is Will. He's the best. He's, and he's handsome. And, and they say when... In 32 years. Well, you t you've been together with Will for 32 years? Yeah. You know what they say, where there's a will, there's a way. Yeah, and where there's skills with a Z, there's a happy marriage. <laughs> so how can we take you home and go to bed with you tonight? Uh, well, you can watch Can't Stop the Music. You can watch Child of the 70s, the f uh, fourth season that's coming up. Um, you can get my the CD. One of the CDs I have out now is Ticket to the World. Or you can get If I Can't Have You. Or you can get New York City Boy. Um, you can get all of my music online in iTunes or Amazon. You can do, get my book, Macho Man, The Disco Era. Uh, you can Thank get you my, with us. You can get my new CD coming out next spring called Mr. Right. And uh, you know, it's the wrong. No, not me. I'm Mr. Right, baby. What about Mr. Right now? Mr. Right, whenever you want it. <laughs> Amazon delivers in 50 minutes. So how can we order this? Do uh, you have a website? Uh, yes, uh, randyjonesworld.com, or you can find me on Facebook. Is that your real name, Randy Jones? Uh, Randolph Edward. Wow. But Randy's, you know, works, works. Especially when I'm in England. <laughs> yeah. That group will live on forever, won't it? Uh, well, I think so. I think, it'll go, I think the songs, the music will go past us, definitely. Definitely, because it makes people feel good. And you cannot, anytime music um, makes, helps the listener smile and feel good, I think it's, it's worthwhile. Wow. Yeah. It's amazing. It's been great talking to you. How many years has it been, did you say? 1977. Wow. Your biggest hit was? First hit? First uh, was San Francisco Hollywood. The first major hit was Macho Man, but the biggest hit was YMCA. And as of last year, we've sold 125 million records. And who wrote those songs? Everybody. We had a big stable of people. But there's a, Jacques was credited as a composer for most of them. And anyone still alive? Yes, yeah, some of the members are. Yeah, some. Some. I am. <laughs> what about Jacques Borelli? Yeah. No, Jacques is dead. Oh. Henri is alive. Um, some of the guys in the group are. Some are dead. Blank is still alive, right? I think it's part of the Universal group. Really? Universal NBC, yeah. Unbelievable. Yeah. All right. So, so I'm uh, going to come and I'll help you do that. I'm to see this. Yes, I will. And we'll do Can't Stop the Music. I can't wait. Me too. It's the musical extravaganza that launches the 80s. It's Alan Carr's Can't Stop the Music. You can't stop the music. Once you see it, you'll know why you can't stop the glamour. Do the shake. Do the shake. Do the shake. Do the shake. Stop the excitement. Fun to stay at the YMCA. Fun to stay at the YMCA. They have everything so you meant to enjoy. You can hang out with us. You can't stop the dancing. You can't stop the laughter. Magic night. Magic's in the music. It's a magic night. We all need to use it. We can have a good time and enjoy all the magical vibes on this magic night. Good friends all around you. It's a magic night. Magic show. But most of all, you can't stop the music. You can't stop the music. 
can't stop Nobody the music. Starring stop Village the music. People. Take the heat from flame. Try to feel the Not only for I. Though you try in vain. It's what she see you know. Bruce Jenner. Can't stop the music. Nobody can stop Steve Gutenberg. She's the master plan. Take the Paul Sand. Co-starring Tammy Grimes, June Havoc, Barbara Rush, Out to Be Davis, Marilyn Sokol, and a special appearance by the Ritchie family. Once it begins, you can't stop the music. Musical sounds of the 80s are composed and produced by Chuck Corelli. Watch for the exciting new Pinnacle Photo Book, an EMI film from AFD. Original soundtrack records and tapes available through Casablanca Records. Hey, this is Randy Jones. I'm the original cowboy from Village People, and we are somewhere here in the village. And you know what? I'm just thinking... Maybe Barry Z is the missing village person that we've always been looking for. Or he could have been Dopey from the Seven Dwarves. I'm not sure. What do you think, Barry? I'm not going to answer that. It's the Barry Z Show. It's the best. With a Z. Tune in. Oh. Don't miss it. <laughs> Hi, it's Barry Z from the Barry Z Show, live in Brooklyn, talking to the legend himself, Sonny Fox. My God. Not your God, just your friend. Wow. You went to the school that we're in now. PS217 is my alma mater. I graduated here at 12 and a half years of age in 1938. Wow. How old does that make you now? Older than you and taller. They're always taller, right? Um, and, and How old are you now? 90. God bless you. You don't look a day over f 10. No. I was going to say 5, but 10. No, no, no. I, I, I feel good. I, I, my parents gave me three really great genetic gifts. Longevity, leanness, and hair. Wow, that's true. true. It's a little, a little cash wouldn't hurt, but I guess that's not genetic. Wow. That's not genetic. And you're celebrating your 90th birthday? I celebrated it. I'm well into my 91st God year you. already. Thanks. I was on your show called Wonderama. Right, and I remember you that remember you told me, me that. I told you that. <laughs> you were also on a show called Just for Fun. That was also that was my short show. That was only two and a half hours. Why? Why was it short? I don't know because what happened was after I did Wonder started doing Wonderama and it was a hit. I went to the people at Channel Five and said I want more money. They said no, but if you want to do another show, we'll pay you more money. So then I started Just for Fun. And I did that for five years until they paid me enough money on Wonderama. Wow. I could drop just for fun. Were they on Saturdays and Sundays? I did the weekend, and the other guys, Sandy and Soupy and Chuck, did the weekdays. Soupy. Soupy Sales, who's been on my show many times. Soupy Sales. Soupy, listen to that. Soupy, Sandy, Sonny, and Chuck. Four ah. grown-up men without a decent name among wow. them. And you were the tallest. How tall are you? Uh, in a good day, 6'2". I was 6'3 when I did the show. Well, not only do I remember you from Just for Fun and Wonderama, I remember you from a show called The New Yorkers with Penelope Wilson. Oh, that was wonderful to remember that. That was the show that I left Wonderama for. They came to me and they said, we want you to do a new show, daily, two and a half hour show. <clears throat> and I said, okay, but, ah. but you've got to stop doing Wonderama. I said, why? Oh. Well, we want you to be a totally adult personality. I said, well, let me try it for 13 weeks. You may hate me. I may hate you. I do have a wife and four children and a mortgage, and this is my sinecure, Wonderama, and I don't know. So I said, no, take it or leave it. Wow. So I thought about it long and hard, because I, I love doing Wonderama. But I thought, we loved you. Yeah, but I thought, so I've been doing it for eight and a half years, and I was running out of ways to do Hanukkah and Passover and Easter and Christmas, and I thought, no, maybe, maybe I need a new challenge. So with great regret... And very quietly, I shuffled off from Wonderama. And it, it you know, I, I tuned it on six months later, I think. 
And Bob McAllister, no. Uh, and it was a, such a different show because Bob was a performer, which I was not. So he could sing and he could do games or whatever. And then these, the kids really became what they were for Super Sandy and Chuck, which were an audience. In my show, I didn't have any talent. I didn't do puppets. I don't do... That's true. I don't do puppets. I don't throw pies or anything like that. The only resource, <laughs> the only resource I had was my relationship with the kids. Oh, so the really? kids became the show. They were not an audience on my show. They were the show. They were the show, yeah. I was on the show. That's right. So and I won prizes, too, you know. There you go. That's why you're so, I'm so beloved, I'm sure. Why was it called Wonderama? It was called Wonderama because it started many years ago before I got on. And somebody made up the title. Wow. And it was on Fox 5? It was Metro Media then. On, uh, well, actually, it was on Dumont, I think, when it started. But anyway, it went on. It was one six hours in Sandy. No, what year was that? It was, wait a minute, Soupy, Soup, no, it was, yeah, I guess Sandy and Chuck did that show for a while. And then it got to be another guy. Then I got a call and I said, we want you to take over the show and make it smarter than it is. And I said, well, I had been doing network shows on CBS. And I said, oh, I don't know. Do I want to be on a local station? Do I want to, you know? But I figured, okay, I do have a mortgage. And so I, oh, so I took it. And it took me a while, a couple, three months, to figure the show out. And once I got it figured out, it took off. And it never, it never went back. And today, I knew we were, we could tell we were having big audiences. You read the ratings on Mondays. What we couldn't know then is that, as expressed by you tonight, the, the amount of wonderful recall and connection I still have with my kids, right? And they come to me and when I, they recognize me, they revert to 10 years old like that. Oh, I remember I was on your show and I told a joke. What was the joke? They'll remember. Or I, I missed a word in the spelling me. What was the word? They'll remember the word, you know. Unbelievable. I just heard about, from a, a woman here tonight, about her son who was on twice, and each time he took home a Murray Lenders bagel <laughs> with his name on it. So, and he, they hung, he hung it on the wall. It's still on his wall all these decades later. Wow. So when you leave a thumbprint on a malleable oh, mind did. at that age, it lasts. You did. Can I call you daddy? No. no. There are several children who can and already <laughs> do. Now, not only did you do Wonderama, and you really can't define the name, the Wonderama, can you? How about Just for Fun? I made that one up. That was fabulous. I made that one up. All those stunts. But you did uh, Midday Live and uh, The New Yorkers. Yeah. The New Yorkers were what I left Wonder Mama for with Penelope. You named her. She's now Penelope Coco Hall. And we just were together up in uh, her part of the world. I was up there for something. We all we went out and had dinner. So we're still in touch. She's lovely. Uh, and she has a large tract up there. And she lives a life of a... A, 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 what do we call her? A landowneress in wow. upstate New York. Land Baron, huh? But she's always as classy as she always was. And it was WNEW TV Channel 5, Metro Media, right? Right. Was, did, uh, the, well, Fox bought it. That's right. They had a Fox on, took the Fox off, then the Fox. Done that. And the studio was. And you were Sunny Fox. I was. Well, I changed my. You were the Fox. I would go on the Fox lot in LA. And they'd say, name, I'd say Fox. And the guy would look at me and I'd say, yeah, I changed my name. I, when I go to Warner's, I'm Warner. And I, that, what is your real name? Fox. Is it really? Yeah. Sonny Fox. Well, I, that's not my given name, Sonny, but that's my name. What was your given name? You, no, I'm sorry. Verboten. Stick Verboten. I love it. I don't, I'm not that secure. Now, let's talk about tonight. All right, but one quick question. You were in one of my favorite movies of all time called The Christmas That Never Wasn't. That almost wasn't. It almost wasn't. Get it right if it's your favorite movie. For it almost wasn't. I think it was, uh, uh, it was a strange movie in many ways for me. But uh, okay, I'm glad it was your favorite movie. Wow. It was done in Italy. Yes, right. And Rosanna Brazzi was in it. Well, no, his wife was in it. He directed it. Wow. And uh, I spent some time with him and his wife. We and, had fun. And the guy from the Rocky Horror Show was in it, right? What's his name? Uh, what's his name? Rocky Horror. Uh, the star of Rocky Horror. Kenana Hara. I don't Ken know. Hara. What was the star's name from Rocky Hara? It doesn't matter. Don't look it up. Don't look it up. We got to talk about tonight. Yeah. Oh, of course we have to talk about tonight. PS 217. By the way, I have to also say to you, you were a landmark television pioneer. 
telling the FCC that they had to have children's programming in New York? No, no, we tried. We tried to take over Channel 11. We almost did. We lost four to three at the uh, FCC. That was a very interesting 10-year effort to take over their license because they were a terrible station then. No comment on where they are now. I live in California. I don't know where they are. But however, tonight I'm back at PS217 from which I graduated in 1938. That's 78 years ago. And tonight I will be standing on that stage and the absolute desire is to raise money for this incredible school, which now has become so much better a school than when I was here. It's only up to fifth grade, but it's now a magnet school of the arts. It has a polyglot com uh, uh, population. 50% of the students are from Bangladesh or Pakistan. Now, I was an immigrant child when I was here. My mother was an immigrant. So now there are another immigrants. They don't look like me, they don't sound like me, but they're immigrants. And they are doing such a great job because they're an arts-focused school. And I did a class here. I just walked into the school I heard. last year, cold. I, I just wanted to go back. You know, at my age, I'm on my farewell tour, I figure. So I wanted to, and I was so taken with this that now I'm back tonight doing a show for them so that they can raise money to help support what they do in this remarkable school. So PS217, thank you very much for what you're doing, and I'm delighted to be here. What is tonight's event called? Um, Brooklyn to Broadway? Yeah, no, Broadway to Brooklyn. Oh, okay. Yeah, get it right. At any rate, yeah, I've, I did eight television shows in the 80s, one hour each, hosted by, each one hosted by a leading lyricist or composer, or in some cases both, for the Broadway musicals that defined the golden age of Broadway. So, Alan J. Lerner, uh, Sheldon Harnick, Kander and Ebb, Yip Harburg, and so on. They're and bringing Fiddler back to Broadway, you know. Yeah, I do, and Sheldon is delighted about that show. Now, most of these people, Sheldon being one of the two exceptions, he and Charlie Strauss, um, are all dead. And I have them in a uniquely in a unique way explaining what they do singing their own songs talking about their anecdotes so tonight we're going to explore whole the, the, the protean talents of these people and it's a school of the arts great place to do it wow okay are we finished I wait a minute i found out who was in that movie with you the christmas that almost wasn't tim curry from the rocky horror show yeah how about that i didn't know i didn't know that so in terms of your career now presently and your career in the future Where I stay alive that's my career really what is the advice then for what? people to stay alive get the right parents yeah get the right parents and get some good genes how about that as a starting point how do you follow your career do you have a website yeah sunnyfoxtv.com go up there there's clips up there you'll love in letters <laughs> I, don't want, I don't want word to get around here who are you going to marry my friend, he's in my class. He, he used to be in my class. His name is Eric Webb. Eric Webb? How old is Eric? He, he's, um, I think he's seven and three quarters. Well, uh, Eric, is that his name? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, I hope you and Eric are, are remain good friends for a long time. Is he still in your class? No. Do you see him at all? Sometimes at lunch. At lunch. You look forward to lunch, huh? To being able to see him. Well, I think Eric is very lucky to have a friend like you. And I, I, I uh, I, I, you know, I hope you remain good friends, okay? Mm -hmm. And he's very small, but he's very cute. <laughs> okay. I think I like Eric, and I've never even met him. You're small, but you're cute, too. I was going to bring him over, but my sister, she was so <laughs> nutty. She lost two tickets, and I had to uh, let her borrow one of mine, so I couldn't invite him. Oh, that's dreadful. I would have enjoyed meeting Eric. Would you come back someday and bring Eric with you? Yeah. I hope so. We'll make arrangements for that, okay? I certainly would like to meet Eric. Hi, I'm Sonny Fox from Wonderama, and you're watching the Barry Z Show.